For some time already, Mr. Verloc's immobility by the side of the armchair resembled a state of collapsed coma, a sort of passive insensibility interrupted by slight convulsive starts, such as may be observed in the domestic dog having a nightmare on the hearth rug. And it was in an uneasy dog-like growl that he repeated the word, astronomy. He had not recovered thoroughly as yet from that state of bewilderment brought about by the effort to follow Mr. Vladimir's rapid, incisive utterance. It had overcome his power of assimilation. It had made him angry. This anger was complicated by incredulity and suddenly it dawned upon him that all this was an elaborate joke. Mr. Vladimir exhibited his white teeth in a smile, with dimples on his round, full face, posed with a complacent inclination above the bristling bow of his necktie. The favorite of intelligent society, Women had assumed his drawing-room attitude, accompanying the delivery of delicate witticisms. Sitting well forward, his white hand upraised, he seemed to hold delicately between his thumb and forefinger the subtlety of his suggestion. There could be nothing better. Such an outrage combines the greatest possible regard for humanity with the most alarming display of ferocious imbecility. I defy the ingenuity of journalists to persuade the public that any given member of the proletariat can have a personal grievance against astronomy. Starvation itself could hardly be dragged in there, eh? And there are other advantages. The whole civilized world has heard of Greenwich, the very boot blacks in the basement of Charing Cross Station know something of it. See? The features of Mr. Vladimir, so well known in the best society by their humorous urbanity, beamed with cynical self-satisfaction, which would have astonished the intelligent women his wit entertained so exquisitely. Yes, he continued with a contemptuous smile, the blowing up of the first meridian is bound to raise a howl of execration. A difficult business, Mr. Verloc mumbled, feeling that this was the only safe thing to say. What is the matter? Haven't you the whole gang under your hand? The very pick of the basket? That old terrorist Unt is here? I see him walking about Piccadilly in his green Havelock almost every day. And Michaelis, the ticket of leave apostle. You don't mean to say you don't know where he is. Because if you don't, I can tell you, Mr. Vladimir went on mincingly. If you imagine that you are the only one on the secret fun list, you are mistaken. This perfectly gratuitous suggestion caused Mr. Verloc to shuffle his feet slightly. And the whole Luzane lot, eh? Haven't they been flocking over here at the first hint of the Milan Conference? This is an absurd country. It will cost money, Mr. Verloc said by a sort of instinct. That cock won't fight. Mr. Vladimir retorted with an amazingly genuine English accent. You'll get your screw every month and no more till something happens. And if nothing happens, very soon you won't get even that. What's your ostensible occupation? What are you supposed to live by? I keep a shop, answered Mr. Verloc. A shop? What sort of shop? Stationery. Newspapers. My wife... Your what? interrupted Mr. Vladimir in his guttural Central Asian tones. My wife, Mr. Verloc, raised his husky voice slightly. I am married. That be damned for a yarn, 
exclaimed the other in unfeigned astonishment. Married? And you a professed anarchist, too? What is this confounded nonsense? But I suppose it's merely a matter of speaking. Anarchists don't marry. It's well known. They can't. It would be apostasy. My wife isn't one, Mr. Verloc mumbled sulkily. Moreover, it's no concern of yours. Oh, yes, it is, snapped Mr. Vladimir. I am beginning to be convinced that you are not at all the man for the work you've been employed on. Why, you must have discredited yourself completely in your own world by your marriage. Couldn't you have managed without it? This is your virtuous attachment, eh? What with one sort of attachment and another you are doing away with your usefulness? Mr. Vladimir, puffing out his cheeks, let the air escape violently, and that was all. He had armed himself with patience. He was not to be tried much longer. The first secretary became suddenly very curt, detached, final. You may go now, he said. A dynamite outrage must be provoked. I give you a month. The sittings of the conference are suspended. Before it reassembles again, something must have happened here, or your connection with us ceases. He changed the note once more with an unprincipled versatility. Think over my philosophy, Mr. Mr. Verloc, he said with a sort of chafing condescension, waving his hand towards the door. Go for the first meridian. You don't know the middle classes as well as I do. Their sensibilities are jaded. The first meridian, nothing better, and nothing easier, I should think. He had got up, and with his thin, sensitive lips twitching humorously, watched in the glass over the mantelpiece, Mr. Verloc backing out of the room heavily, hat and stick in hand. The door closed. The footman in trousers, appearing suddenly in the corridor, let Mr. Verloc another way out and through a small door in the corner of the courtyard. The porter, standing at the gate, ignored his exit completely, and Mr. Verloc retraced the path of his morning's pilgrimage as if in a dream, an angry dream. This detachment from the material world was so complete that, though the mortal envelope of Mr. Verloc had not hastened unduly along the streets, that part of him, to which it would be unwarrantably rude to refuse immortality, found itself at the shop door all at once, as if borne from west to east on the wings of a great wind. He walked straight behind the counter and sat down on a wooden chair that stood there. No one appeared to disturb his solitude. Stevie, put into a green baize apron, was now sweeping and dusting upstairs, intent and conscientious, as though he were playing at it. And Mrs. Verloc, warned in the kitchen by the clatter of the cracked bell had merely come to the glazed door of the parlor and putting the curtain aside a little had peered into the dim shop seeing her husband sitting there shadowy and bulky with his hat tilted far back on his head she had at once returned to her stove an hour or more later she took the green baize apron off her brother stevie and instructed him to wash his hands and face in the peremptory tone she had used in that connection for fifteen years or so. Ever since she had, in fact, ceased to attend to the boy's hands and face herself, she spared presently a glance away from her dishing up for the inspection of that face and those hands which Stevie, approaching the kitchen table, offered for her approval, with an air of self-assurance, hiding a perpetual residue of anxiety. Formerly, the anger of the father was 
the supremely effective sanction of these rights. But Mr. Verloc's placidity in domestic life would have made all mention of anger incredible even to poor Stevie's nervousness. The theory was that Mr. Verloc would have been inexpressibly pained and shocked by any deficiency of cleanliness at mealtimes. Winnie, after the death of her husband, found considerable consolation in the feeling that she no longer tremble for poor Stevie. She could not bear to see the boy hurt. It maddened her. As a little girl, she had often faced with blazing eyes the irascible licensed victualler in defense of her brother. Nothing now in Mrs. Verloc's appearance could lead one to suspect that she was capable of a passionate demonstration. She finished her dishing up. The table was laid in the parlor. Going to the foot of the stairs, she screamed out, Mother! Then, opening the glazed door leading to the shop, she said quietly, Adolf. Mr. Verloc had not changed his position. He had not apparently stirred a limb for an hour and a half. He got up heavily and came to his dinner in his overcoat and with his hat on, without uttering a word. His silence in itself had nothing startlingly unusual in this household, hidden in the shades of the sordid street, seldom touched by the sun, behind the dim shop with its wares of disreputable rubbish. Only that day Mr. Verloc's taciturnity was so obviously thoughtful that the two women were impressed by it. They sat silently themselves, keeping a watchful eye on poor Stevie, lest he should break out into one of his fits of lucacity. He faced Mr. Verloc across the table, and remained very good and quiet, staring vacantly. The endeavor to keep him from making himself objectionable in any way to the master of the house put no inconsiderable anxiety into these two women's lives. That boy, as they alluded to him softly between themselves, had been a source of that sort of anxiety almost from the very day of his birth. The late licensed victualler's humiliation at having such a very peculiar boy for a son manifested itself by a propensity to brutal treatment, for he was a person of fine sensibilities, and his sufferings as a man and a father were perfectly genuine. Afterwards, Stevie had to be kept from making himself a nuisance to the single gentleman lodgers, who are themselves a queer lot, and are easily aggrieved and there was always the anxiety of his mere existence to face. Visions of a workhouse infirmary for her child had haunted the old woman in the basement breakfast room of the decayed Belgravian house. If you had not found such a good husband, my dear, she used to say to her daughter, I don't know what would have become of that poor boy. Mr. Verloc extended as much recognition to Stevie as a man not particularly fond of animals may give to his wife's beloved cat, and this recognition, benevolent and perfunctory, was essentially of the same quality. Both women admitted to themselves that not much more could be reasonably expected. It was enough to earn for Mr. Verloc the old woman's reverential gratitude. In the early days, made skeptical by the trials of friendless life, she used sometimes to ask anxiously, You don't think, my dear, that Mr. Verloc is getting tired of seeing Stevie about? To this, Winnie replied habitually by a slight toss of her head. Once, however, she retorted with a rather grim pertness, He'll have to get tired of me first. A long silence ensued. 
The mother, with her feet propped up on a stool, seemed to be trying to get to the bottom of that answer, whose feminine profundity had struck her all of a heap. She had never really understood why Winnie had married Mr. Verloc. It was very sensible of her, and evidently had turned out for the best. But her girl might have naturally hoped to find somebody of a more suitable age. There had been a steady young fellow, only son of a butcher in the next street, helping his father in business, with whom Winnie had been walking out with obvious gusto. He was dependent on his father, it is true, but the business was good, and his prospects excellent. He took her girl to the theater on several evenings. Then, just as she began to dread to hear of their engagement, for what could she have done with that big house alone, with Stevie on her hands, that romance came to an abrupt end, and Winnie went about looking very dull. But Mr. Verloc, turning up providentially to occupy the first floor front bedroom, there had been no more question of the young butcher. It was clearly providential 